Well, praise God, church, and it is good to be here. Truly, I was just, when I came here today, I just felt like, oh, this is it. This is where I belong, and I'm so glad to be here. And we've had a big week, a humongous week, where we went camping, and uh, we had a great time at camp. I want to let you know, I think uh, three-fourths of the younger teenagers are gone because they're still getting their sleep. Uh, So we had an amazing time at camp, uh, as you know, usually do. We have a lot of fun. Um, One thing I love about the the, the younger teenage boys is they, uh, one of their biggest accomplishment was that they pulled a all-nighter. They stayed up all night. And I remember coming into the morning to wake one up to go to pray. And he's like, but we pulled an all-nighter. He was so proud of this. You know, I'm like, I'm proud I have an all-sleeper, you know, like sleep all night. And uh, we had a great time. We had, you know, fun and, and the, the typical fun. And I want to thank all the staff, everybody who helped. You know, I think there's a lot of you guys here who helped and uh, planned for this, you know, pray for this. And uh, we had a great time. And the, but the thing that I loved about camp this year was we, I, I, from my perspective, uh, we had an amazing time together when we were worshiping, when we were gathered for some kind of bigger thing than just fun. Well, the fun was amazing, and, and, and we had amazing service on Saturday night, and then we had uh, on Sunday amazing service at, in the evening, but also during the day. We got to talk, and we sat down in a circle, and we just talked about all kinds of topics, and we talked about dating, and we told everyone, no dating if you're in middle school. And then after that, it's about whether you're ready to get married. And then we talked about friends and the kind of friends you have and how we need to get rid of bad friends, get great friends. And then we talked about relationships and we talked about um, uh, entertainment and, and purity and so forth. So we had an amazing time. So tonight, I felt like it's going to be an amazing sermon to talk about obedience. And I'm going to read one passage. I read this a long time ago, but I have kind of a different take on this passage. In Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 5, verse 1 through 11. So my sermon title today is The Obedience Chain. The Obedience Chain of Events. The Obedience Chain of Events. We all know what disobedience does. God has put his word in this book. He told us how to live. He wants us to follow after him. He wants to be the authority over our lives. He said how we, what he thinks and how life should be and, and, and so forth. And so we all know kind of the disobedience chain. Where does disobedience lead us? So if you rebel, if you disobey, We kind of know that, you know what, you know, it will lead you to, in a downward spiral, it will lead you to uh, not listen to God, but listen to a cluster of other voices, voices in society, the devil, yourself, and not a good indicator of what is right and good, uh, friends that are bad, and then, you know what, you'll eventually end up in kind of this despair or even death, spiritual death for sure. That's where disobedience leads us. But what about obedience? Where does obedience take take us? What is the chain of events with obedience? And this story, I believe, portrays for us a beautiful flow when me and you say, God, we submit to you. Yes, God. God, we agree. You are the authority over my life. God, it's painful, but I submit where that takes us. And we'll see four things when we have obedience. So I'm going to read in chapter 5, verse 1. And by the way, no PowerPoint today. And this was on purpose because I feel so addicted to PowerPoints. And I'm like, you know what? I need to break this. I just need to talk to you sometimes from the Bible. So uh, chapter 5. So it was as the multitude pressed about him, Jesus, to hear the word of of God. Just imagine, Jesus is speaking, and he's speaking what? The word of God. In my message, there will be bits. In my speech, there will be bits of God's word. With Jesus, his speech is God's word. Okay? Just think about that. 
Anything Jesus ever says, that's God's word. Amazing. That he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, sometimes don't, don't you feel like that sometimes with, God's, with, with the Bible? Jesus, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had gone th done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat. Now, why is it the other boat? Because the way it worked was, remember, these nets are not like these little nets, and they're like, whew, kind of sweep up, a little fishy. These nets would be like very long, and they would be between two boats, and they would have like weights on the bottom, and it would just be, you know, catching fish and it like circling in. That's what I found out. So they signaled to the other partners to come to the boat and help them. And they came and filled the bo the, the, both of the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and son, son, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. Notice, first thing that I want to talk about is verse 5. Notice what kind of obedience Peter has. Okay? Jesus tells Peter, get out, go far, we need to catch some fish. And Peter says what? He says, look, in verse 5, chapter 5, yes. We worked all night. I want you to catch this. I want you to catch this. This is so profound. Notice what Peter, or Simon, bases his obedience in. He disagrees with Jesus, okay? Going out, catching fish during the day for Peter, who's a professional, that doesn't make sense. He has a different idea. And yet Peter obeys. Why? Why does Peter obey? Peter disagrees. Peter has a different take. Peter understands different. Peter understands professionally differently. Peter still Obeys. Let me give you at least five ways Peter disobeyed, okay, from experience. When Peter says, we toiled all night, like we worked all night, Jesus, and we caught nothing. Here's what Peter's saying, Jesus, this did not work. Jesus, it's not going to work. Experience. We know where this, how this goes. No fish means no fish. But at your word. Peter could have disagreed with Jesus in this sentence, also not only experientially, but from know-how. Jesus, we're not going to catch any fish because this is not how you catch fish. What does he mean by that? You catch fish at night. In this lake, like you would go at night work because the fish would swim up to the top, you know, eating mosquitoes and butterflies, not butterflies, excuse me, mosquitoes and little bugs. And then during the day, these fish would go deep. So during the day, you don't catch fish. So he could have said, Jesus, look, 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 we toiled all night and took nothing, basically saying, Jesus, we won't catch anything because that's not how fishing works. But at your word. Peter could have disagreed with Jesus on the basis of social embarrassment. Jesus, nobody fishes during the day for this kind of fish. I got friends and they're on the shore. They're going to make fun of us. Okay, this is like not going to be, go, this is not going to go down well for us. Peter could have disagreed, number four. 
with his physical body. Like if you work all night, you washed your nets, how many of you are like, I got to hit the haystack. I got to go get some sleep. He says, look, Jesus, we worked all night. We're tired. We're exhausted. It's not going to work. But at your word, Peter could have disagreed logically. Jesus, come here. We didn't catch any fish. Okay? The fish are gone. There's no way we're going to catch fish. What does that mean, Jesus? No fish. No fish means no fish. Means no fish. So logically, but Peter still says, at your word, how many of us, on some level, find certain parts of this book difficult to agree with? I think if we're honest, and if we're reading this Bible correctly, there are bits and pieces in this Bible that should make us angry. And should make us like, oh, come on, I don't, what? Like, truly, like, if you're reading the Bible correctly, it shouldn't be like, wow, this is the most beautiful story I've ever written or read. Like, better than the most romantic story ever. This would hurt you in some ways. If you read this Bible correctly. And sometimes we disagree with the Bible from experience. And we say, Jesus, yeah, you tell us not to do this. Partying is wrong. And physical intimacy before marriage is wrong. But Jesus, from experience, look at them. Look at that couple. They're all right. And look at that person. They're all right. And, and, and you know what, Jesus? Actually, from experience, I know you think that, you know, uh, physical intimacy is not the right thing. That's called fornication. That's, you know, sleeping uh, belongs in marriage. There's children here. So basically, Jesus, like, you say this, but I have seen it not destroy people. In fact, we can say this. Sin is not always immediately destructive. Sin is always ultimately destructive, but not right away. Remember Adam and Eve? They were told they're going to die. They ate an apple, excuse me, not an apple, a fruit, and they didn't die. You got Eugene, but they died spiritually. Absolutely, absolutely. But by death, it was meant everything. Creation was destroyed, and you're going to die eventually. They died eventually. And sometimes we look at people, and we're like, look at this, Jesus. Ah, partying, having fun, living the young life. I mean, whatever you do, whatever sin's out there, we're like, look, they're not dying. Destruct it's not that destructive. All sin is ultimately destructive. We can disagree with Jesus from know-how. Like, God, I think there's more important things than what we do with our bodies, like poverty, systemic poverty, hunger, social justice, and so forth. Those are, by the way, very important, but we could say that. We could see, disagree with Jesus socially and say, you know what? Some things here, God, I just, I get made fun of if I say I believe this. And we can disagree with the Bible from our physical flesh and say, God, from our feeling, I just don't feel like doing some of this stuff. I'm tired, it's hard, I'm young, let me live. And I want to let you know this, that Peter's obedience, catch this, was not based in alignment of his experience and the knowledge he has from his experience from what Jesus was telling him. And it was not based on alignment of his know-how with what God and Jesus was saying. It was not based on whether he's, it's socially acceptable and he understands it to be with what Jesus is saying. Peter's obedience is grounded not in alignment, but in trust. Where he says, God, despite all of this, you know better. You know better. Like, check this out. Check out verse 5. Okay? This is what we have to do. We have to come to this place where we say, God, Jesus, I'm tired. I don't necessarily see it this way. I get made fun of for thinking this way and believing this. I don't really, I, I just, I don't know about this. But at your word, what is your, fill in the blank, master. Fill in whatever you want. But obedience says, Jesus, you know better. It is obedience that's grounded, not in how much I align myself with the Bible, 
but it's grounded in me just saying, God, you know better. You see, when this happens, this misalignment between our experience, our know-how, and what God asks us to do, by the way, it's never going to align perfectly. I want to say we'll never, ever, till the day we die, see everything God sees. And the reasons are many. Okay? God's knowledge is perfect. Our knowledge is incomplete. That's right there. This is one reason why we don't necessarily always agree with what God is calling us to do. Is he has perfect knowledge, we don't. We are fallen. He is holy. You know what this means? This means that if we're fallen, this means that, you know, we're not, we're not the best decision makers when it comes to knowing what's best for us. If we're fallen, sometimes we want sin. Actually, a lot of times. We're not the best. That's where our hearts are going to gravitate. Hey, listen. God is long-term. We are short-term, aren't we? We always think short-term. Like you and your emotions right now, how happy you are, it's based on what has happened today, a couple days ago, and a couple days in the future. That's it. Like that's where your emotions are. God's perspective is eternal. He doesn't ask what's good for you right now. He's asking what's good for you in eternity. That's going to lead us to some conflict here. I'll tell you one couple more things. I love this. Do you know what God's greatest desire for you is? It's an H word. But I like to think that God's greatest thing he wants for me is for me to be happy. I want to tell you, God wants a different H word for you. Do you know what God desires for you? A different H word. Holiness. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, here's what the Bible says. Do you guys know your Bibles? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 3 says this, For the will of God is your happiness. Nope. For the will of God is your sanctification. That's what God wants for you. That's what God desires in your life. Like, oh, come on, Eugene. So listen, this is what happens. When you're driving from work to home, you're like, man, in this traffic, I want to be happy. Like, God, reduce the traffic somehow. God, take away the traffic. Make sure the traffic goes down. Let's get that accident cleared from the road. God, I want to be happy. And God's looking at that traffic and being like, but I want you to have this traffic and in this traffic be holy. Let me turn up the traffic. God wants us <laughs> to be holy. He wants our holiness. God, I, I want to get married. God, bring me the one or let me be found by the one. And that's going to make me happy. God, don't you want this? I want this. This is going to make me happy. And God's saying, you know what? I need you to first learn to depend on me. And not because God doesn't want us to be happy, but because happiness, we, what we really need is an ultimate happiness, and that happiness is tied into how closely we resemble Jesus. He wants our holiness. Do you see why we kind of don't align naturally with what God says? Hey, listen, let me give you one more. There's plenty of them. We are solution-driven we think solution always. You know what God's thinking? Salvation. In this story, you can think of this story when Jesus makes this, all this fish come out and the disciples gather all of this fish. You can think of in this story like, oh, I see what Jesus is doing. He's solving the problem of no catching fish. That's what Jesus is doing. That's the S, solution. But God is thinking, <laughs> I'm not here to fill your boat with fish. I am here to give your soul salvation. And when Jesus is making those fish come up, and that great fish, Jesus is thinking about salvation. So here, here's what first thing I want you to do about obedience, is don't stop yourself thinking. I must first align myself 
and see how God sees and understand how God understands and I'll obey. Don't wait on your obedience. If you're waiting on your alignment, you're most likely walking in disobedience. And we say, God, some things are beyond me. And I grew up in a society like today's and some things I don't understand. But at your word, I'm letting down the nets. We're going to go quickly. Notice what obedience does. This is so good. The second thing, so obedience leads to, leads to revelation. In verse 3 and 4, can we put it up on the screen? When Peter obeys Jesus, Peter gets to know Jesus deeply. Check this out. Getting into one of the boats, his, Jesus asked Peter to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Stage one is when we go out a little bit and we know what Jesus teaches. We, un, we know what the teaching is. And I want to say that the whole world, probably in America especially, everybody knows in some way what Jesus teaches. I live on Twitter, so I go on Twitter all the time. And I remember hashtags. Hashtags are like stuff people are talking about. And one of those hashtags was what Jesus never said. And everybody is writing what Jesus never said because they obviously know what Jesus said. Everybody knows what Jesus teaches. Most people always know what Jesus teaches. Do not judge. What else? If somebody hits you on the right cheek, give them the left. If somebody asks you to one mile, go two miles. We know the story of the good Samaritan. We know the, the story of the good, the, not the good, but the prostitute and how Jesus didn't said whoever has a sin, pick up the stone and throw it. That's stage one. But guess what? G Peter knows what the teaching is. But Jesus tells him to put out. And Peter is about to find out who the teacher is. Right now in stage one, he's just sitting there and he's learning what Jesus is saying. And he knows what the teaching is. But when P Jesus in verse four says, go out a little deeper, Peter is going to know who the teacher is. And do you know what that link is? Obedience. And obedience takes us into a greater revelation or understanding of who Jesus is. And obedience takes us into a greater understanding of who Jesus is. And Peter says, Lord. Peter did not know that Jesus, who Jesus was, at least did not believe it. Peter did not know Jesus. Peter knew the teaching, but obedience takes him. I want to tell you that when we obey God's word, and we listen to what God has said. And we say, God, at your word, we get a deeper understanding of Jesus. Not because obedience pays God. And God's like, okay, I have to now tell you who I am. But because obedience leads to intimacy. And intimacy leads to walking with Jesus. And when we walk with Jesus, naturally, we are exposed to the beauty of God, the provisions of God, the promises of God, the power of God, the grace of God. Because we're walking with him. We're in the boat with him. He's going to reveal himself to us. We're going to know his goodness. We're going to know what he's done for us. We're going to value him and treasure him in our hearts. So what we see is obedience of Peter leads him into a greater revelation of Jesus and then, step three, let's read down. When, Jesus, when Peter says, Master, we told all night, notice this, obedience leads us into a deeper understanding of Jesus. And a deeper understanding of Jesus leads us into worship. Peter falls on his feet, and he just repents. And he says in verse 
Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Now, does that look like worship? Depart from me. Imagine if we were singing a song, worshiping God, that says, Depart from me, I am a sinful man. But I'll tell you why this is worship. Because Peter grasped the worthiness of this man, man God, Jesus. You see, when we have a deeper understanding of Jesus, we will always end up on our knees proclaiming, you are worthy, I am unworthy. Forgive me, Jesus. Now, he didn't say this, but we believe he said this because in the next passage, well, in verse 10, Jesus says, do not be afraid. So there's a proclamation of worthiness. There's a proclamation of how unworthy I am, my sin, and there is forgiveness because Jesus, when he replies, says, do not be afraid. You know what the beauty of this passage is? <laughs> when Jesus says, do not be afraid, Jesus does not say to Peter, Peter, yes, you are a sinner. Peter, this is what I needed to hear from you. Peter, absolutely, you are a sinful man. How could you? Jesus doesn't even acknowledge or talk about Peter's sinfulness. He moves on. You know what that tells me? That if you and I acknowledge our sins before God, he will not acknowledge our sins on judgment day. And if we live our lives not acknowledging our repentance and our fallenness on judgment day, God will count that sin against us. But Jesus forgives him. So we have obedience leading to revelation of who Jesus is, leading to worship. And here comes the best part. From worship, they get out, they come to the shore, and comes mission. Obedience led Peter to know who Jesus was, which led Peter to worship God, which led Peter to mission. And I believe that our missions are supposed to flow from our worship. And when we say, you know, God, declare this is who you are. And God, this is who, how loving you are. And this is your goodness. And we experience this. And we confirm this. And we see this. You know what happens? We leave this place or leave our personal moments of worship in our day with this, I gotta. I gotta follow you better. I gotta prioritize your interests over mine. I gotta be on a mission for God and people. I gotta. I cannot do any otherwise. I don't know. After all of this happened, the Bible says in verse 11, they brought their boats to land. They forsook all and followed him. That's what happens when we encounter Jesus. Now, let me put it this way. Does this chain always work out? No. There's always, you know, something ahead or something that, gets us to be obedient and, and so forth. But I, I will tell you this. Obedience always leads to greater glories. And what is stopping you today? And why are you or me and what part of our lives are we holding back from submitting to Jesus? What part of our lives are we saying, God, I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to hold on to it myself and do here in this area what I want. And it's going to be my word over your word. It's going to be what I understand over what you tell me. Maybe it's in parenting. Maybe it's with finances. Maybe it's with our friends. Maybe it's in our families, in our marriages. Maybe it's with our entertainment choices. Maybe it's in who knows what. But what part of your life have you refused 
to submit to God and say, God, your word over mine. And God, I know people will make fun of me for this. And I know that my experience maybe shows differently. And I don't feel like obeying you in this. But God, despite all of that, Master, we toiled all night. At your word, I'll let my, down my nets. At your word, God, I will obey. I will let your rule, your lordship, govern what I do with my body. I will let your lordship and your word govern and control what I do with my finances. I will let your rule and your word govern what I do with my body. I will let your rule govern, your word govern what I do with my time. That's what we got to start. So I don't know what's holding you back. We're going to have a moment right here to pray. And I, I think that most of us are pretty good at diagnosing the big stuff, the life stuff. But it's the little stuff I noticed and realized we overlook. And we say, no, 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 no. God probably doesn't care about that. And that little thing is blocking this chain of obedience in my life. And that little thing is blocking me and stopping me from walking in intimacy with Jesus. And that little thing is stopping me from a deeper understanding of Jesus. And that little thing is stopping me from understanding deeply Jesus, which leads me to worship. And that little thing is stopping me from deeply understanding Jesus, which leads me to worship, which leads me to my mission. God wants all of our lives. He wants all of our lives. He wants everything. And he wants for us to say in everything. I just, I just want to keep saying this, everything. I'll let my, down my nets. I'll do as you want me to do. Not my will, but your will. Amen. The beautiful thing is, it's while we are so imperfect and we disobey, Jesus was perfectly obedient. He never, <laughs> can you imagine? He ne Every moment of his existence on this planet, he pleased the Father fully. And God the Father is looking at Jesus and being like honestly, I think, amazed with Jesus. And he was perfect. So that when you and I are not, he forgives us. When you and I are not, he helps us. I know some of you are saying, Gene, some stuff is hard, harder for me, and it's too much for me, it's more than I can handle. I want to get, tell you some news. There, everything in the Bible is more than you can handle. Everything God asks of you is more than you can handle. But no thing in the Bible is more than you can handle with, with God. Is that with God, everything is handable. And with God, everything is possible. And we could submit to God and we can come to God and we could repent and thank, G thank Jesus for his forgiveness and say, God, I need your grace. I need your mercy. I need your spirit. Empower me to live my life boldly, courageously, despite how I feel, despite what people say, despite, I don't know, whatever, everything else I said, despite that, allow me to live obeying you. Let's stand up and pray. Jesus, we thank you. We love you. We worship you. God, we see in chapter 5 what where obedience leads us to. We know where disobedience leads us to, but we know where obedience leads us to. Walking with you, knowing you, knowing your provisions, promises, power. Lord, so I'm going to ask us, I'm going to ask you that you would help us submit to you 
all of our lives. Even the parts we don't see, even the parts we don't understand, even the parts that will cause us discomfort, even the parts that our society does not understand, even the parts that our logic fails us. In every part, we submit to you. And for what we have hold on to for ourselves, we repent. And we repent. And we know that your obedience was perfect. And you pleased the Father. And we have forgiveness in you. So thank you, Jesus. Thank you for everything, God. Empower us. Help us live for you boldly. Amen.